be. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Media Boat Podcast. Today is March the 10th, 2021. If you don't know what the Media Boat Podcast is, we are a podcast that celebrates and discusses all kinds of media, but mostly movies, television, video games, and music, not necessarily in that order. We have thoughts about things we've watched slash experienced slash played, whatever. We have news stories for you. We have new releases, all of that fun and more. My name is Matt. His name is Mike. I'm Mike. He's Matt. And real quick, we have both good news and bad news. Well, (laughs) not good news and bad news. Happy and sad news. Always, always. First off, it is March 10th. Happy Mario Day! Yes, it's Martin Day. I refuse to call it Mario Day. Okay, March 10th, Martin, Mario. Martin, because that's how I'm like, wearing my Mario shirt it. because it's Mario Day. For I those see that. YouTube. I do not have a Mario shirt. Uh, maybe you'll get one tomorrow. Um, here's a copy of Super Mario Odyssey. There you go. There's my Mario Day contribution. That's okay. I'll play some uh, <laughs> Mario Party later today. Oh. Right. That, that's fitting. Celebration that makes sense. of Mar- March 10th, Mario Day. Cool. Um, so that's the happy news. Sad news is that if you are a long Mario listener, died today at the age of 30. No. Why? Versus the sad if news. If you are a longtime listener of the Media Boat podcast, you will know that every March we do a bracket. Yeah. Ugh. Well, we're still in pandemic. We're still not in person meeting, and therefore we will not be doing an annual bracket this year. Yeah, uh, we just don't have the time that we usually have. Also, it's easier to do it in person. Uh, so similar reasons why we opted out of finishing the one from last year, kind of same reasons apply this year. We'll hopefully get back next March and do another bracket for you, um, old or new, we're not sure. Um, but yeah, it just didn't come together uh, in time this year. Just too chaotic. So... Yeah, um, also don't have to currently have the space or bandwidth to sit down and do three hours of podcasting. No. Six I hours of podcasting. Definitely. I normally do to do not. put out these episodes. Yeah, no, I've got no bandwidth. My bandwidth is gone <laughs> lately, so yeah. So That's yeah, not going to do it this year, but I still may throw up a special something something at the end of the month. Yeah. Maybe it's in the cooker. Not saying a bun's in the oven, just saying that it's <laughs> on my to-do list uh-huh. as bonus material should I get around to it. Yeah, I don't I don't need to know about your buns in any ovens. Like, no, you I, don't. But I do don't. need to know about the box office. Yes, well, <laughs> thanks for that segue. Um, that So you could avoid talking about your buns in your oven. Um, <laughs> yes, the box office is sort of existent this week. Um, so kind of what we've been doing in the background is... We've only been reporting on movies that make over a million dollars. That used to be few and far between. But this week, turns out your entire top four are all million dollar movies. First up, topping the box office, your new Disney release and the biggest movie right now in theaters, Raya and the Last Dragon made a respectable $8.5 million in the pandemic. Uh, Followed by Tom and Jerry, which we talked about last time, $6.6 million. I don't know why. That's at $23 million domestic, not including HBO Max revenue. The Raya numbers, by the way, obviously are not including Disney Plus premiere revenue as well. Three, Chaos Walking with $3.7 million. And four, Boogie with $1.2 million. I don't know what Boogie is, but I sure like saying it. It's not that kind of Boogie. It's a basketball movie. Wait. Okay. I don't understand how that's different, but okay. You can be, you can boogie on a basketball field, basketball field, basketball court. My brain. You know your sports ball. My brain is gone. <laughs> I swear. I knew. I know what a basketball court is. Anyways, <laughs> let's talk about movie news. Why don't we? Let's just keep rolling right into it. And our first story uh, is about. Two, well, there's two movies coming out this week: uh, The Courier and The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I skipped right past new releases. You're right. So those okay. two. This um, is not going to be a common occurrence. 
yeah, we, there's no really new releases anymore. So that's why I totally skipped it. But yeah, so those two, are those just theatrical or do you, uh, are they, do they have streaming equivalents for either? At this point, I'm assuming everything has streaming equivalent. Um, yeah, on demand. but you don't know which, oh, you mean like a, a la carte, not- A la carte, not, not a okay. uh, streaming service. That's kind of what I'm asking. Like it only really, we should talk about it if it's on a streaming service, but if it's just VOD, we don't need to. Okay bother with pointing that out. But what we do need to point out is these news stories. And the first thing we have a story about Oscar favorite Nomad Nomadland director Chloe Zhou. You mean Golden Globe winner That's for director true. and film Chloe Zhou? That's also true, uh, fresh off of those awards. Well, there's been some controversy, at least from portions of the globe, about the director. Apparently, she was quietly swept from the Chinese web on Friday, days after nationalist backlash erupted online over questions of her citizenship and a sentence she spoke to a U.S. magazine nearly a decade ago. Nomadland was granted approval for an April 23rd limited theatrical release via, via China's Natural, National Art House Alliance of Cinemas in February. While many in China cheered Zhou as an inspiration for becoming the first Asian woman ever to win the directing Golden Globe, thousands of others have taken to online blogging platforms since Monday, demanding to know her nationality, incensed by the thought that they would celebrate her achievement if she isn't really a Chinese national. A more troubling sign for the film's Chinese prospects came as China's key online ticketers, Mayo and Yan and Tao Piao Piao, I butchered that, I'm sorry, moved to remove the April 23rd release date from their listings. Nomad Land will go directly to the recently launched Disney Plus offshoot Star when the film launches on April 30th in the UK. No word on movement of these Chinese distribu distributors. Um, so it is of note that Chloe Zhao was born in Beijing, China. Uh, her parents and her moved to the U.S. She is a film director. And years ago, the quote in question for the magazine basically said that she felt more freely to speak in the U.S. than she was in China. Okay. So, so the question really isn't here of her sure. nationality, because by on paper, her nationality is... Chinese. She just has lived a bulk of her life here in the U.S. Correct. Um, so the question is, is just the, it seems like the nationalist Chinese are very, um, they don't want to give her the credit when they believe she is not the proper, like a proper Chinese, like nationalist and doesn't, they want to basically treat her as an outsider because of this quote and don't want to have this like pride for her because of that. It's like calling Elon, not calling Elon Musk a South African. <laughs> it's not even. Even no, though he was born in South Africa. Yeah, we don't have time for that. Anyway, no, <laughs> so yeah, I, this sucks because obviously she's done a great job here. She's worthy of these awards. And it is a statement uh, that she is of, of that nationality and making these films. Um whether or not, you know, there's a lot of things you can say about the nationalist movement in China, um, but they definitely seem like they're very quick to gatekeep who is and who isn't based on what they say are their actions. And it's, it's controversial and it's obviously, there's only so much we can speak to it, but yeah, it's not, right. it's a bad look. But it is also something you should keep an eye on because as we mentioned last podcast, Chloe Zhao is the director of the upcoming Disney Marvel film, The Eternals. And how this plays out may affect how that film will play out, whether it, it will be allowed into Chinese markets. Disney's moves here will be interesting to watch because if they decide to remove her just because they want that movie to play in China, that might that would make a lot of people really pissed. Might be too late to remove her because mm -hmm. it's already filmed. Yeah. It's in post-production you may see an added credit mm. as in like directed by uh, Zhao and someone else. Regardless of what they do, it's going to get, people are going to be pissed. Um, 
right we'll because see. it's her film that's already shot if you're trying to play this to chinese nationalists to get into that film market it will be a bad look on disney if they don't back their creators yeah we'll see what happens we'll see what disney does um hopefully nothing but we'll see well hopefully this will get blown over and <laughs> they'll just let her show the film I don't know. I think if we've learned anything over the last year, nothing gets blown over. Let's move on. <laughs> Speaking of stuff that blows, Tom and Jerry yeah, is does. still bad. Uh, we talked about it. We talked about how bad it is. How bad is it? It's so bad that when you turn it on on HBO Max, you might not even get that. It's so bad, you might not even watch the movie that you're supposed to watch. <laughs> okay, let's explain. So HBO Max this past weekend had a weird glitch for some users. Some people tried to play Tom and Jerry and were instead met with the upcoming Justice League Snyder Cut. So yeah, the anticipated four-hour film of the Justice League Snyder edition um, is not technically out on HBO Max until March 18th. That being said, several users from East Coast Twitter noted that they attempted to watch Tom and Jerry but are instead able to access the first hour of Justice League before it cut off unceremoniously. Some users shared screenshots of Justice League, but on Monday night, Twitter sent takedown notices on behalf of Warner Brothers to those who shared those screenshots. Uh, Warner quoted, Zack Snyder's Justice League was temporarily available on HBO Max and the error was addressed within minutes. So it's too late, you missed it, but a a quarter of people, like a portion of people, got to get a little sneak peek. Yeah, and took to Twitter and people were happy. <laughs> Although, are you happy watching Justice League instead of Tom and Jerry? I don't know. I feel like, one, I feel like that, that the overlap there of audiences is not, no, I don't know if they overlap not. that much. And two, <laughs> so I can imagine just a lot of people just be like, ew, <laughs> turning it off. However, you might get maybe a marginally better movie. Uh, not having seen either the original Justice League or this version of it, maybe it's a little better than Tom and Jerry. I don't know. The jury's still out. <laughs> so I had recently watched the 2017 Justice League. The original cut. In preparation for the upcoming <laughs> Snyder Cut version. Uh -huh. Are you ready? Like, Are you prepared? It wasn't as bad as I had remembered. Oh, is that only com in comparison to Wonder Woman 1984? Yes, that's okay. part of the whole comparison. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as I as I thought or I remembered. Maybe Batman v Superman was worse. Yeah, but it's still, I think, a fine superhero film. Definitely has its flaws in the third act. Yeah, so we'll see how much of that gets uh, fixed. Probably none of it because it's even longer and probably all over the place so get ready not sure how uh jared leto's joker will help <laughs> in any of that I, um, but hey it's coming march 18th i mean i i on gave up on that thing as soon as that screenshot came out of jared leto's joker saying we live in a society <laughs> so like i'm out i'm out washing my hands of that one speaking of washing my hands of that one actually not really speaking of that but i need a segue it's time to move uh, on to terrible thoughts. Segue. Terrible segue. But hey, it's time to move on to movies that we watched this week. We didn't watch one. We didn't watch two. We watched three movies right. of, I'm guessing, varying quality. Um, there's one that I know you're probably raring to talk about. And there's probably another one that you want to uh, get rid of very, very quickly. Uh, the one I also have one that I want to uh, wash my hands of, actually. There's the segue. Um, so let's talk about those two first. Let's get them out of the way. I will go first real quick. So I didn't watch the big movie this week. So instead I was like, oh, well, I can sign up for the free trial for Paramount Plus and check that thing out. I did. And I was able to uh, watch the, I guess, um, biggest movie release on that service right now, right? Like what else is there? I mean, um, it is the movie that they kind of promoted to yeah. say, hey, if you want to watch this movie, you yeah. need to watch it on Paramount Plus because that's all it's you're going to watch. Because it also was delayed from last year. It's been kind of in mm -hmm. the cooker for a while here. So I'm speaking of SpongeBob SquarePants, Sponge on the Run, which is, I think, the third SpongeBob film. So there's the classic one and then SpongeBob the Water. 
Yeah, right? Because I don't remember, so I didn't see that second one, and it's almost like that I can't recall anything about it because uh, I've never they, seen it. There were references to superheroes in that movie. Oh, you're right. Okay, that's what that one is. It was the superhero one. That's why I completely, yeah, for some reason it's left my brain. And watching this movie, apparently it's left everybody in this, like the, the, the cast and crew of this thing's brain too. Because this movie is weirdly like half a reboot of the original film and half a pitch for their new Paramount Plus exclusive spinoff series. It, the uh, Camp Coral? Yeah, it is such a weird film. I don't know. It almost feels like it's two different movies sewn into each other. So real quick... Um, the first half of the movie is kind of put, hits some familiar beats if you've seen the 2004 SpongeBob movie. Like SpongeBob and Patrick have to go on to go on a road trip, so there's a lot of the same kind of beats there. There is a plot later about about a king, like King Neptune, mm -hmm. not the same King Neptune, a different version. Also, the animation is different this time. They've opted for a CG interpretation of the 2d style of the television show so like if you're just passing by you might think it's 2d animation but it's not everything is cg there are brief moments of live action um not as much as in the original one but like scattered throughout but then at some point when they need to like i guess have padding in the third act they have a bunch of flashbacks to spongebob's childhood and explains how he met all of his current friends in this camp coral setting of course if you're a longtime watcher of the show this is kind of a retcon because there are episodes of the show that establish how these characters all met each other throw all that in the garbage because apparently they want you to believe that they all magically went to this camp Every even, single character. Even though, yeah, every single character. And even though you're probably thinking, wait a minute, aren't they varying ages? Like, you're telling me that Squidward is not older than SpongeBob, even though I just always assumed he was? Somehow, no. They're all the same age now. It's like, it's like hey, remember when every show had a baby's equivalent? Muppet babies, etc. It's Rugrats, like that. Babies, yes. It's like, Rugrats different. <laughs> Anyways, but like it's like that. And I'm like, why who what was this? Um it's not a very good movie. It's very lopsided. It has moments of like SpongeBob charm, but it's just overwhelmingly long and and like I said, it, it hits too many of the same beats as the original movie that I kept thinking, why why'd they bother making it so close to the first one? especially when the second one existed and nobody remembers anything about it. Uh, so yeah, it's just weird. Uh, again, I'll say what I've been saying. I said about Tom and Jerry, which is if you need a family movie, skip this, watch Flora and Ulysses instead. Um, this is only for really like the diehard of SpongeBob fans. And even then they might be disappointed by the things that they retcon and the things that they kind of shoehorn into this thing. Uh, real quick, I will also say that I watched the pilot for that Camp Coral spinoff. Nope. Also, don't bother with that thing. It's even, like, it's it's aimed towards kids younger than even the um, original series was. It has maybe very fleeting, like, bits of SpongeBob humor, but really does not hit the mark. At is all it because of the animation or the jokes? It, so the jokes I was, what I, was, I was talking about, but also I'm glad you mentioned that because I was just going to say, also the animation looks terrible in that thing. The movie does a really good job of, of showing this Camp Coral setting. The television show looks like it's a Nick Jr. like budget like thing that came out of nowhere. I don't understand why they didn't spend more money on this thing. Um, it looks really bad. It looks very mediocre. Um, is it like the difference between Jimmy Neutron the movie and Jimmy Neutron the TV show? Maybe worse. 
Maybe worse. Oh, maybe worse. It's like I said, if you watch any of the like the, the like anything aimed towards preschoolers on your Nick Juniors or your um, Disney Juniors, uh, th it's that level that they're operating on. And uh, yeah, I was like, kids are going to see this and be like, and know immediately that this is not worth their time. So yeah, yeah don't bother. Bad. Don't bother. They did also just say last week that they greenlit a, a another spinoff of SpongeBob about Patrick and his family. Maybe that'll be better. I don't know. It just seems like that. Um, I don't want to be crass here, but as soon as Steven Hillenburg died, it seems like they're really taking advantage of that franchise in ways that they haven't before. That's the movie. I will say does have a touching dedication to him at the end, and the television sh and the uh, the Cape and yeah, the Camp Coral show also has him as listed as creator and executive producer on the project. So he did. He was involved with these things before, but before his his passing. But something tells me that there's a level of quality control that may be being skipped. Hmm. Yeah, it's disappointing. As a fan of that original show, it's disappointing. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Paramount, Paramount Plus in the television section. Uh, won't go on very long with that, but there are some things that I want to say about it. But but yeah, don't bother with the SpongeBob stuff. Okay. So it's a yeah. Okay. It's an it's a pass. It's it, I don't recommend it. Oh boy, if you let's didn't talk, like that, let's talk about another pass. I'm ready. All right. So <laughs> Raya and the Last Dragon. <laughs> You're funny. No, talk about the other one first. But this is the one that was going to talk about. No, I don't believe you. you talk believe about right. the one that the internet is taking a giant crap on. I want to know. I don't okay. have Amazon, so I can't watch this. But I hear it is. A trash fire. So, <laughs> coming to America. Yes. The sequel to coming uh -huh. to America. Yeah. <laughs> stars Eddie Murphy and Arsenio. As you Hall, might imagine. As you might imagine, in multiple roles. <laughs> I question the naming it coming to America <laughs> when one, we don't spend a lot of time in America. <laughs> And two, you come to America only for the first end of the first act to pull a person into the world of the African kingdom, only for them to be pulled back into America, for them to be pulled <laughs> back into the kingdom. It's a really weird movie, and it should be called <laughs> Coming to America. No, it doesn't sound like it. No. Also, if you've seen Aladdin, either the C the live action remake or even the original one. That's basically this what this movie is. What? That's basically what this movie is. Is there a genie? No, I mean. <laughs> no. I was gonna say you can't just say something is Aladdin. That's not that's no, not what that but is. The plot is exactly the same though. <laughs> that y a prince needs to marry a princess in order to mm -hmm. rule the kingdom, and a princess can't rule alone. Uh -huh. because of laws. And oh man, if only we could abolish that law for some reason. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. too bad we can't. Oh, well, too bad tradition. Oh, wait, <laughs> I make the traditions. That's the movie. Okay, I just saved you uh, Amazon Prime <laughs> in two hours. So are you a fan of the original? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel like we're, we're coming in under the wire on that one. I feel like the generation right before us thinks that movie is great. Well, see, I did a double feature, so I watched them back to back. Okay. Uh, I think the first one has a lot more charm into it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the second one definitely feels like it plays into that part nostalgia factor, part we were purposely setting this 30 years later so we can make 30-year-old jokes at ourselves. Yeah. Uh, but it's a fine movie if you have, like I said, if you haven't seen Aladdin or any <laughs> type of variation on that type of story, then it's a fine movie. Okay. But Aladdin did it better. Yeah. <laughs> And has more, it's more fun and a musical. Hmm. Okay. So it's okay. See, yeah, I didn't like, I, completely cringe at it. I didn't completely hate it. Okay. I like I the wonder, costumes, though. I wonder if a lot of the negative press is getting is from people who are really big fans of the original. Maybe that's Possibly. Because I came into this with low expectations. Uh -huh. And I didn't immediately shun away from it. Okay. Although at the same time, I kept saying, wow, this is just Aladdin. <laughs> I want to say it again. 
I'm going to drill this into your guys' head. You've said it multiple times. You should go watch Aladdin, the <laughs> the one with Will Smith. I was going to say, just watch the original one. Don't bother with the remake, but okay. Yeah, but the one with Will Smith like actually hammers that point home, too. like Even more so than the animated version. Hmm. I don't know if Aladdin without a genie sounds appealing at all to me. You, uh, <laughs> yeah, because not a whole lot of wish granting. It's just no. a lot of taking. And <laughs> what you would expect to be cultures collide doesn't quite collide as much or hit as funny. How is Eddie Murphy? It's Old. been a little bit since he's been, yeah, since he's been in the he uses CG, in a movie he, like this. It uses that like CG de aging technology in this. Oh, really? Do they? Okay. Yeah, because they uh, reshoot some original scenes. Oh, uh, got it. And I was like, oh, that actually looks like really good uh, deep fakes. I am impressed with that. All right. Which I uh, uh, I think Eddie Murphy was on record saying he wouldn't do the movie. Um. Unless it had the, that kind of technology in it. Oh, okay. And uh, what movie was it? It was a recent movie that he saw with someone else that did the de-aging technology. And it's mm. like, oh, we can do that now? Okay, maybe I am interested in <laughs> revisiting some of my work. Wow, that's funny. Who knew? Oh, it was uh, the uh, Terminator one. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. That makes sense. Genesis. Yeah. Well, was that the last one? Yes. Dark Genesis. Fate. Wait. Yeah, what, what which which one of those was the last one? Dark Fate? No, so Genesis was the one with Amelia Clark. So Dark Fate was Dark the most Fate recent was one. the last one. Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> the last one I, mean, I saw what, was both of them had a de aged Arnold though. Right. They all do. <laughs> That's At, this <laughs> At this point. At this point. Anyway. Anyways, so, okay, so you're not as not as down on this as I thought it you were gonna be. No, I'm not I'm not like all yeah, you should go watch it, but I'm also like, uh eh, don't watch it. Especially I mean, I guess if you're like a super fan of the original one, maybe you might not find it as funny. Mm -hmm. But it definitely has a certain charm about it. Okay. So yeah, it's not completely terrible, not completely a waste. Okay. It's just it So your is, mileage may vary. Your mileage is definitely going to vary. Okay. All right. Speaking of mileage and varying. All right. Let's open the can of worms. Mm. Uh, so I'm seeing a lot of hyperbole thrown around about Raya the Last Dragon. I've Raya. seen Raya, Raya, whatever. Right. Raya. Uh, I've seen a lot of very highfalutin quotes about how good this thing is. Um, but $29.99 is a bit of a high price tag for people who don't want to see it in a theater. What do you think about Raya? So I bought this, well, not just for myself, because I have people sharing my account. And right. They're like, yeah, I'd be interested in watching it. Good excuse. <laughs> uh, so latest to Disney animated feature film, Raya and the Last Dragon, follows Raya as she searches for the last dragon. Hey, what do you know? Hey, very simple concept. <laughs> um, it has a lot of Avatar vibes mm -hmm. thrown throughout it. Um, not just it being Southeast Asian culture, but also from five warring nation tribes who right. each house a piece of the last dragon gem and guard it with secrecy. And it's up to Raya to get the pieces together and mm -hmm. save the last dragon and defeat the evil Druids. Okay. From turning people into stone. So real quick. Real, real quick. quick. Uh, is this a musical? No. I okay. feel like at some points it could have been a musical. But they opted out. But they opted out. It's okay. not a musical. I'm not sure if it would actually benefit from it being a musical either. Probably not. Not because the characters themselves like aren't capable of singing. <laughs> But rather that the story moves so quickly, they might not have time a lot for of it. information that yeah. you kind of don't have a whole lot of time to. Okay, throw in. I was just curious because it's been a while since they made one of these things without. Uh, well, I mean, I guess Zootopia would have been the last non-musical of these. Right, because you forget Wreck It Ralph breaks the internet. Oh right, right, you're right. The Wreck It Ralph movies are also not musicals. 
Okay, so those those three. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, why does everyone forget about Wreck It Ralph? Because I don't like Wreck It Ralph, so that's my Come excuse. <laughs> anyway. Anyways, um, so the animation on this thing is pretty much worth the price of admission alone. Okay. It's beautiful. They're just fucking with us right now on doing water physics up the wazoo. Oh, Everything is wet. Water and hair, <laughs> water and clothes. Careful, my 4K... Pixar was good. Careful, my 4K television might hear you, and I'm going to be out $30. If you thought uh, Moana was good with its ocean and water physics, uh -huh. ha, they've upgraded. <laughs> Uh, if you thought the opening of Toy Story 4 was great with those rain and water Jeez. physics from Pixar, yeah, uh -huh. it's a lot better here. Uh. <laughs> so the animation in this thing is the high point. Okay. Storytelling, not so much. Uh -huh. But your mileage may vary on it. Okay. Because while it's a story about learning to trust other people, you don't really get that kind of vibe going in. I had to watch this thing twice and I found it better the second time knowing what I know from the story mm -hmm. because if you watch it the first time through you may have some questions on why they did certain things as you're watching it only if it all makes sense at the end and then when you watch it through the second time and third time you're like oh <laughs> picking up on a lot more like oh they're trying to drop hints here here and here that you don't really pick up on the first uh, first viewing. Mm -hmm. Which is both good and bad because you shouldn't do that. That shouldn't be the case for watching a movie multiple right. times. Right. But at the same time, it's good for those eagle eyed viewers because you can see the breadcrumbs that they kind of leave throughout yeah. the movie. Um, I'm kind of bummed you didn't watch this because there's yeah. some story beats I would love to go over with you and how they should uh, <laughs> rework this thing. Yeah. Because it does feel like they go over the same beginning twice in two different ways. Hmm. And your beginning of your movie isn't the beginning of your movie. It doesn't start until 10, 15 minutes into the movie. Hmm. Okay. It's, so it has some trouble getting going. Mm -hmm. But once it gets going, it gets going. And it's a fun family adventure. Okay. Um, the side characters didn't quite um, knock me as bad as I thought they would, including the baby, the thieving baby that they uh, put in the commercials. Okay. Didn't, uh, didn't quite knock me as like, oh, like clearly they're just pandering here, but no, it works. Okay. Uh, the team up that they have is a good variation of characters and shows that... Um, quite subtly to trust people of all ages from young mm -hmm. from like babies to children to your peers to older and mm. because it's uh the five kingdoms you kind of do get that avatar vibe of the five different nations at war with each other yeah there's a lot of lore in this and i can see this being expanded upon i've seen a lot of people on the internet saying that this should have been a tv series it very well could be. I mean, they very could definitely could do a Disney Plus series after this. I mean, you could give it a couple of years and, hey, we have a Tangled series and mm -hmm. we have an upcoming Moana series. Yeah. So. And we had a Big Hero 6 series. Also, Disney, also not a musical. Right, 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 fine. <laughs> I missed some. I get it. Anyways, okay. So it's a little bit more adventure-y. Um, Sounds like it doesn't, like there's a lot of reference points to other media. It doesn't necessarily follow all the way through for you, but it does an okay job. It does a better job than most people are trying to give it credit for. Mm -hmm. It does the right amount of Disney, ma Disney magic and Disney storytelling yeah. to keep you invested. I'm saying you as an older person and not just you as a kid watching this because uh -huh. I was quite invested watching it too. That's good. Um, I'm going to, yeah, I would give this a good recommendation of go ahead and buy it. Um, it's a good $30 to spend. It's something that you can watch on multiple times. 
especially you. especially as we've talked about before on this podcast if you have a family of people like it's it's a good like amount of money for a night of entertainment for multiple people mm -hmm. it's just hard for me to be like well one because of like physical like reasons why i can't and then other reasons because i'm just one person and so yeah it's harder for me to reconcile with the price point um but for a lot of people out there it makes sense yep uh i would also recommend this if you have any young daughters or mm -hmm. young uh girls in your life because a lot of girl power in this film <laughs> and a lot of strong female leads that's good it's a very good movie for them. I know that some people tend to gravitate towards those kind of characters. Mm -hmm. And this is a really good example of strong female leads in a movie. Good. Speaking of which, I've heard some um, kind of scuttlebutt around the edges of this, of uh, the conversation of this movie, talking about its lead character potentially showing some signs of, if, if not, um, uh, same-sex relationship uh, potential or it, like of some sort of thing with another character in this film. Not having seen it, I'm not really sure what that talk is about, but do you, did you see any of that? Uh, there was friendship between girls. Okay. There's nothing outright stating right. otherwise. Because Disney wouldn't at this point There's no <laughs> like straight-up romantic lead between them. Mm -hmm. It's more... We, we're friends, we're trying to be friends, we're trying to trust each other, we need to trust each other. Okay. And this movie is built around trust rather than romance. Okay. I just, just was just curious um, because there's been that conversation going on about this movie. Uh, I'm sure people are shipping these characters <laughs> together. I mean, yeah, of course. So, okay. Alrighty. Um, anything else you want to talk about movie-wise, or are we good to move on from the Did I talk section? about the animation? Yes, yes, you did. Animation. <laughs> no, I can't wait to see that on my television at some point. <laughs> That's exciting. All right. That'll do it then for the movie section. Let's roll right into sports, which is how we start the television section. Sports Corner. And man, sports. we have a lot of sports to talk about this week. Sports happened. Uh, first uh, up, Well, it's just the All-Star game. Yeah. yeah. First up, your all-star weekend happened in the NBA. Team LeBron beat Team Durant 170 points to 150. Domantas Sabonis. So, Sabonis? You got that right, Sabonis. Okay. Wins the skill challenge. Steph Curry won the three-point contest. And Fernie Simons won the slam dunk contest. It's Simmons. There's one M. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> you can't type it like that and then say it's Simmons. It says Simons right there. All right. <laughs> and media vote favorite Giannis scored 35 points on 16 to 16 to win the All Star MVP. Giannis, who? And, you know, <laughs> his last name. <laughs> The Greek guy. You're not going to uh, try it. I didn't get a bother. Uh, that is the most makes without a miss over an entire All-Star game ever with a minimum of 10 shots. The yeah, previous 16 record, for 16. Yeah. Perfect shooting. The previous record was held by Hal Greer, who went 8-8 eight to eight in 1968. No coincidence. So, yeah, if you shoot a perfect game in the All-Star game, you're probably going to win the uh, Kobe Bryant MVP award. You think? I, I would, yeah, I would probably assume that. Um, <laughs> so did you watch, did you watch this all-star business? I did. And I wondered how Kevin Durant allowed LeBron to be on a team with <laughs> Steph Curry and yeah. Giannis Antetokounmpo. Yeah, I think your, your, your balance was a little off on there. Um, well, it's more like, hmm, who'd you pick first, second, and third then? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I heard from some people who are watching this that it was a very weird presentation this year where, like, the, the slam dunk contest happened in the middle of the game. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this is all happened in one day. Yeah. The skills challenge and three-point contest happened in the hour before the All-Star game happened. And then at halftime, they did the slam dunk contest. That just seems like a lot, if you ask me. Yeah, but not all the same players are in the same. Event. Right. That's true, I guess. I mean, because it's supposed to be a two-day event where you do the skills, the three-point, and the slam dunk on day one. Mm 
mm-hmm. as well as the NBA induction. And then the all-star game itself is it's its isolated. Game. Yeah. Yeah. But because COVID and they don't want to spread things around, <laughs> pun <Yes>. intended. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no spreading. Spreading is bad right now. Right. But passing is okay in the NBA. Pass- yeah, passing is all right. Also, there was a discussion about like not kissing the the rim of the of the of the of the basket. So that was a dunk. That's what yeah, he won the the dunk. the dunk contest on. Was he jumped so high <laughs> he could kiss the rim of the basket? <laughs> but maybe but don't decided do... not to. <laughs> yeah, but maybe don't. Yes, <laughs> that's fun. All right. In other sports news. In the world of baseball, hey, remember those balls that we talked about? Remember the new balls that dropped? Yeah, we were talking about new balls uh, two weeks ago with the beginning yeah. of spring, spring training. Well, San Diego Padres pitcher Blake Snell says he can feel the difference in those new balls as they rotated in during spring training. So it's not automatic. It wasn't automatically, here are the new balls. Mm-hmm. You have to use these balls. It's use the balls that you have until you run out. Yeah. And then... If you get new balls rotated uh-huh. in on a yeah. basis, they will be the new MLB balls They'll or whatever. Balls. If you're like whatever stockpile that we have, yeah. and then you get the new ones in. So it's on a random basis. So he was saying that he felt the difference when he got those balls. He was saying that he could the feel balls. the uh, stitching difference yeah. when he was gri- gripping the balls. I mean, I will say though, oh, I mean, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I will yeah, say that gripping the balls. You're gripping the balls. Uh, I've watched some um, a little bit of spring training baseball lately, and um, it definitely seems like there's a little bit more lightness to those things. I watched one um, go from Otani's bat right over a freaking entire stadium wall. So, hey, uh, it'll work out for some people. Yeah, I also saw one, I think it was off Otani, that came up <laughs> just a foot short from the wall, uh, too. Um, Side note, Otani's looking good. Side side note, <laughs> for those of you in California, uh-huh. they will be allowed yes. to attend baseball games. And I think all across the U.S., MLB is working with each state and each city to allow fan attendance yeah. by April 1st. Yeah. It looks if like not April. opening day. Yeah, it looks like April is their cutoff for that. Um, and yeah, it looks like, of course, it will be um, a portion of of like not the not full attendance. It will be what's the word? Twenty percent. Yeah, it, it, there's yeah, it won't be entire. It won't fill every seat. But I'm still not gonna. I'm still not gonna go to a game though. Uh, once I get vaccinated, it's one of the first places <laughs> I'm going. Well, I still have my misgivings about how they're doing that. Um, and yes. also, I spent all that money on cable for a reason, so I'm going to stay home <laughs> and watch these games. Anyway, <laughs> seems like a waste if I just go and spend another $80 oh, to go see we'll it. We'll talk in about life. a waste of cable in a minute here. We'll get there. First up, let's finish off sports by talking about the NFL. Dak Prescott, though. Yes, Dak Dakota. Prescott. No, Dakota Prescott. Dis- oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Dakota Prescott Esquire signed a four-year deal, four-year, one hundred and sixty million dollar franchise tag with the Dallas Cowboys, and one hundred twenty millions of it is guaranteed, no matter what happens. Good for him. That one twenty guaranteed is important because the last time we saw <laughs> Dak Prescott on a field, yeah, he was kind of on a cart being taken off the field. Yeah, uh, with a broken ACL femur. Leg was bending the wrong way. You hate to see that. Yes, but you also hate to see four-year, $160 million for a player who has not taken you to a Super Bowl. (laughs) Yes, you do also hate to see that. That is true. Just just to put this into perspective, (laughs) Jared Goff took the Rams to the Super Bowl. They lost, but they still got there. Carson Wentz. Got the Eagles into the Super Bowl. Uh-huh. Well, with some help. But those are two players who took their teams to the Super Bowl and are being paid less than Dak Prescott is, who has not taken his team to a Super Bowl. Yeah. Not uh, probably making a lot of people happy in the league, I would imagine. No, 
but this will be a new benchmark for Deshaun Watson uh, wherever he goes out of Texans. Because I don't know if we talked about that, but J.J. Watt of the Houston Texans, yes, J.J. Swat. Swat, yeah, Swat that's what they did. <laughs> he <is, laughs> went to the Arizona Cardinals. Ah. So well. a lot of people are moving. This is a, one of those like good free agency years where a lot of players go different places. So mm-hmm. um, be sure to check up on your favorite team. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> oh, I have. All righty. Well, guess what? We're not done talking about sports because our big first television story happens to be a sports one this week as we move into the world of hockey. As we previously... Ring, ring. Yep. Ring, ring. Yes. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. They're ringing? Yes. Are are you going to get that? Oh, are you saying that we called it? Oh, we called it. Yeah, so we talked about it earlier on this podcast um, about the ESPN making a deal with the NHL. And finally, the ink is dry. They've reached a seven-year deal to become one of the NHL's media partners starting next season. This is the first time it has been on the network since way back in 2004. The deal will include 25 regular season games on ESPN or ABC, early round playoff series, and once one conference final every year, with four Stanley Cup final series on ABC and more than 1,000 games per season streamed on ESPN+. The deal also includes opening night games, the NHL All-Star Game and Skills Challenge, and other special events. The streaming package offered by the NHL is also moving to ESPN Plus as part of its subscription offerings. That being said, there was no mention about how much of the current seven-year deal is worth. So nobody knows how much money was exchanged here. NBC, the current rights owner, currently pays $200 million a year for exclusive U.S. media rights, but those expire once the ESPN deal starts. So, mm-hmm. yeah, moving on up, ESPN will have hockey again. Yep. Um Big here is that ESPN Plus will be the premier home for all NHL games, even outside of market games. Uh So talking to you, friend of the show, Mark, (laughs) you want to watch your team. Yeah, you might have to get ESPN. You might have to get ESPN Plus. Yeah, Uh, well. Which isn't really that bad of an offer because ESPN Plus is pretty good. Does he get get ESPN proper on his Roku? (laughs) Or, wait, no, no, they were a sling. They, they were, were that's, slingers. That's right, they were slingers. I forgot. Yep. <laughs> Just him and uh, they're, they're meeting with uh, Nick Offerman and slinging together. All right. Uh, but the, yeah, big, yeah, big, big deal, deal here. Big deal. ESPN has not had NHL on it since 2004, which considering when ESPN started, like three days after it started, it showed <laughs> NHL games right up until like the mid nineties. But yeah, NBC stranglehold 90s. on the hockey is no longer. So yeah, we'll see see how ESPN does it. Yep, interesting uh, because as we talked about a couple last month, NBC not only dropping hockey but dropping its sports channel as well, moving all of its stuff to the USA Network and to. Uh, it's it's Peacock Channel or Peacock Streaming Service. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it made the deal with WWE, which showed right. all Peacock stuff, which you can get the upcoming uh, WWE Fast Lane fight on Sunday <laughs> on Peacock. That is the plug for it. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sponsored. Stop shilling for them. No, but if I can <laughs> create a pseudo sponsorship voice sounding, we can get sponsorship. Like just do that. Is that not how it works? You do a <laughs> test sample? It's not. It's not how it works. It's not how any of this works. Okay. What does what does work though is FX's long running American Crime Story series. Love the that cr- American. Yes, the American Crime series that has given us um, Emmy People winner O.J. Simpson. Yep. And the assassination of uh, Versace. Yeah. Um. Sorry, just briefly. Uh, just, there's some technical things happening on one of our sides, and I'm not sure what who it is. Oh, I um, took the server. That's what it was. Oh, <laughs> 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 I 
Nice job. Don't do it again. Yeah. Okay. Um, hopefully it'll catch up. Um, but yeah, there's new news about what the next American crime story will be about. The third season of the series has its new material in the Jeffrey Tubin book, A Vast Conspiracy, the real story of the sex scandal, scandal that nearly brought down a president. Yes. If that name sounds familiar, yes, that is the same, same Jeffrey Tubin who showed his willy on a Zoom call last summer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the series will be titled Impeachment, American Crime Story. Hey, how creative. And will feature Clive Owen as Clinton, Edie Falco as Hillary Clinton, Beanie Feldstein as Monica Lewinsky. That's good casting. Elsewhere, Sarah Paulson is playing Linda Tripp because Sarah Paulson has to be in every single one of these. Annalie Ashford will be Paula Jones. And Billy Eichner is cast well as journalist Matt Drudge. Of the Drudge series Report. Produced Yes, the very same. The series will, of course, be produced by FX and is expected to premiere later this year. Yep. Um, love this series. It's great casting. I can't wait to see what happens, uh, how they tell the story, because the first story of the Travel of J. Simpson was a singular narrative told front to back. The assassination of Gianna Versace was the, the evolution which was the de-evolution of a character going from present to past. So you saw mm -hmm, yeah. what made the assassination happen. Yeah, but this, this is certainly an interesting subject uh, for a lot of people. Uh, I mean, we lived through it, but we were kids, so we didn't really know. It's also really interesting as a good, like, comparison now that we've gone through some other more recent uh, presidential scandals of a different color. And so it'll be interesting to see a modern take on this. And some recent movements as well. Yes, yes, also. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yep, I'm always looking forward to this. Um, I'm surprised they've pivoted away from their original plan for the third season, which was supposed to be about the Katrina disaster. Right. But maybe this is more intimate. You can't really do large-scale productions anymore. <laughs> yeah, they may have just figured that this was a little bit more topical. Right. Even if it happened 30 years ago almost. Oh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yay time. Uh, speaking of time, it is time to talk about the television we're watching, and it's finally time, almost, and I say almost because real quick, before we talk about the big elephant in the room, the thing we can finally talk about after 10 episodes of um. nine episodes of just wild shit. I just really, really want to quickly point out that uh, the last episode of this current second season of Dickinson on Apple TV Plus aired. I just want to really be briefly say that I enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's still basically everything that I said when I first started watching the show still stands. It's an interesting kind of take on the period piece with a lot of like modernization happening on the edges. I think the characters are really interesting. I think it makes... Emily Dickinson, a realistic and interesting figure in the in a way that maybe it's hard to uh, because of the distance between her and how little we know about how her life was. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really interesting show. I think they 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 did a really good job on the second season, and I'm looking forward to a third season and what they do moving forward because there's like a cutoff uh, of information where we don't know what happened to Emily after a certain point. Up until her death so it'll be really interesting how the tv show tackles that hmm. but now with that out of the way we must talk about wandavision wandavision what wandavision <laughs> wandavision yeah. I mean, pick, wandavision pick your favorite of the theme songs i mean <laughs> you have a lot to choose from <laughs> oh, the newlywed couple <laughs> to town. Anyway. So, wow, I don't even know where to begin with this. Uh, there's a lot to talk about when, when you talk about WandaVision, but I guess the first question, did you like it? <laughs> yes, next question. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you like about it? Oh, where to start? I mean, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Where do you start? Because I know. This series doesn't even start at the beginning. Okay, first off, should we just go on to spoilers here? 
I think that yes, in order to talk about this show, I think you do need we do need to spoil it a little bit. So, so I'm gonna wave the giant spoiler tag right here. If you do not want spoilers for WandaVision, fast forward, what do you want to give us? 10 minutes? Yeah. So minutes. fast forward 10 minutes from here if you want to not get spoiled on WandaVision. But okay, or let's if go. you haven't watched the last episode and want to finish right. it before we see us talk about it, because we did talk about this like the week it premiered, saying how you should give it three episodes, maybe the fourth episode, for it to hook you. Yes. And that's kind of where we last left off. So everything here from that last where we last talked about WandaVision. Going forward, we're just going to talk about spoilers from now on, okay? <laughs> that, yeah. That's your Spoiler cut. City. You're entering Spoiler City. Okay, so, yeah, where do you want to start? I mean, I to answer my own question, I guess, I also really enjoyed this, but maybe less as it got towards the end, especially the last episode, I was a little bit disappointed in, because I think in order to finish the story that they wanted to tell, they had to drop the gimmick. Yes. And I get why. But my favorite part of this thing was the gimmick. I think everything about the, the television pastiche that they did here was super creative, super referential. You could always be like, oh, and this is that, and this is this. They do a very good job of tying that into the overarching story by the end, where you realize why Wanda is so reverential to these television sitcoms and that was i liked how they tied it all together ultimately but it got I, really marvelly at the end and that kind of turned me off so yeah the kind of television gimmick of going through the decades is a very nice gimmick that not a lot of tv shows do or even yeah. can do or even possible do yeah um and being able to tie that into the series with it referencing her childhood and how she learned English and kind of those traumatic experiences. Yeah, it's a very good tie-in. I think it was very inconsequential when they started the character of Wanda back in 2015. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, oh, these just happened to line up. Or who knows, because Marvel Comics have been around forever that, hey, we're just stealing from the comics because someone already wrote this and already thought about this. Right. I mean, yeah, it does a really good job of establishing what the next steps are for not only Wanda, but for the MCU in a few ways. There's little, little pieces at the by the end of this series that give you an idea of, okay, so this is what this character is going to be doing. This character is back in the universe now. This character is identified as this character now. And so, yeah, like you get an idea of like what these like new chess pieces they have to move around the board going forward, which is cool. Not something I anticipated going into this. I didn't know this was going to be like, oh no, this is like not only canon, but important setup for the next portion of the movies. Right. And it also dealt with the different phase, not just phases, but different worlds that Marvel deals in, being the magical, mystical world, the space world, cosmic, uh, talking cosmic, as well as earthbound events. Mm -hmm. So kind of smart to start off like this because you do dabble in a little bit of everything and yeah it's a real good show real good acting i like it um uh director and creator matt shackman is i think recently nominated for a lot of the sag awards for this mm -hmm. uh for no no it was the dga director's guild and he got nominated for this series and well deserved too because there's a lot of classic TV tropes, um, not just from a film and TV standpoint of being historians and kind of like that, but how dedicated and faithful it was to those kind of time periods and the techniques that they used for it. Yeah. I think it's a really well-made show on both ends, both the television end uh, where with the, with the television parody but also on the, the MCU end, I think that if you're going in wanting that MCU experience, you get a lot more of it than I anticipated, um, especially towards the end of the series. Um, it delivers kind of on all fronts to a certain extent. 
uh, which, you know, is good and bad in a way. It's good because you're going to get a wide audience and like interested and invested in this thing. But it's also potentially bad because you might lose some people as it goes heavier in the comic book direction. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have to say, I was not lost necessarily. Like I stayed to the end because they did just good enough of a setup in the first half to make me care about the characters. Without that work, a lot of the stuff that happens at the end wouldn't have worked the way that it did as well as it did. So yeah, you need those character moments. And I think what's coming out of this is a, a good point. Like, and I think something that the uh, teams behind the MCU really need to keep in mind is that, is that you have to make sure that you have those moments of humanity or else you're going to, or else this, when the big explosions happen, the stakes won't be there. And I think a television show allows them to have a lot more room to do that than the movies do. And so I'm now very interested to see what they do with um, the next one, which is... Um, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Falcon and Winter Soldier. They're already doing some of that work by getting out there and saying, oh, we're going to have the the character like actually talk about the experience of being a black man in America and stuff like that. They're already out there trying to like lay the groundwork of being like, we're trying to do something ambitious here. It's not just going to be an MCU show. And I think that you need to do that because you have to, hu you have to humanize your characters. You have to make sure that people care about it more than they care about the comic stuff or else the whole thing falls apart. And I think they did a fairly good job of that here. Right, I mean, they, one of the big lines in the MCU is in uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man Homecoming, where Tony Stark says, if you're nothing without this, if you're nothing without that suit, you're not, you don't need the suit or you don't deserve the suit. <laughs> right. And, yeah, that, it's like, this. yes, these are characters outside of just being superheroes and you need to humanize them. That's what Marvel and the MCU does really good is, making you not only believe these characters can't exist, but having that human interaction empathy with them that mm -hmm. you can feel the struggle that they're going through. And that's something that really hit home with WandaVision because, oh boy, do they go through the seven steps of denial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a lot sometimes. Uh, they go pretty heavy in this series occasionally. Um, it's pretty light otherwise, but there's the second to last episode really goes into her background, um, the reasons why she's made the decisions that she makes. There's some trauma mm -hmm. in her history. And, and yeah, it, it does a fairly good job of dra dramatizing it. Um, we should probably talk about some of the plot stuff that is in there on purpose to kind of trip you up. Of course, there's the real reveal that Agatha is the villain. Um, there's the reveal that That the, was not shocking from the comics. Right. If you know anything about the comics, you knew that. I know nothing about the comics, so I was just like, okay. Um, also, the, the reveal that the um, Evan Peters' brother is not actually the X-Men universe one, but is just like an actor that they cast, that she cast in that role. Yes, but that was done on purpose to make it believable. Yes. There's even that line that I had to make him believable because you can't revive your dead brother. Not mind him being on a different continent. Yeah. But because they casted him as that role in order to make us, the fans, believe it was Quicksilver and her brother, it sold it to us as an audience that that was her brother and not just some actor that they put in there. So yeah. it was a real good job in casting and good, real good job in storytelling. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think, but the, it's interesting though, to point that one out specifically because it does kind of more or less their explanation does kind of put a kibosh on everybody's theory that this was going to be the multiverse. Which could put a kibosh on, the Spider-Man Far From Home, which that was going to be the multiverse, which is going to put a kibosh yeah. on Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Badness. 
which is going to be a kind of kibosh on the upcoming Spider-Man uh, No Way Home, which deals with three different Spider-Men, potentially, <laughs> according to yeah. casting news. <laughs> I just want to point that out because I think a lot of people were kind of crossing their fingers that this was going to be the first kind of leap into that world. And no, the, the show ended up fainting and basically like, no, that's not what we're doing here. So a lot of fans, uh, I'm guilty of being in this crowd as well. <laughs> yes. Are riding the hype train of when the multiverse gets introduced into the <laughs> MCU. And at this point, I think WandaVision is my official jumping off point of, you know, whenever they do it, they'll just do it. Yeah. And I'm not going to try and hype it anywhere, wait for it, anticipate it, because I feel like that may ruin and kind of sour my expectations if it doesn't happen. So I'm jumping off that train and be like, okay. They're just going to do it, and they're going to tell us when they're ready. Honestly, Same thing with think, the mutants. They're going to tell us an, when they're ready. I think that's an important lesson for a lot of people in fandoms to learn, is yes. that you can't rush these things, because the more you speculate, the more you're going to disappoint yourself when the thing does not bring you that. Um, and yeah, I think that's happening a lot. I think there's like an underlying... Um, quotient of fans here that are disappointed by WandaVision because of that, because they put invested too much hope in some of these like smaller corners of this world. Um, uh, uh, I think it was on Twitter. I saw that a lot of people put stock in storytelling that they're not telling in the yeah. story that they're not telling. It's true. And that's yeah. Pay attention to the story they're telling and you'll enjoy the story they're telling. Not, Yes. I'll put your wishing and hoping into it and what you want it to happen. They're yeah. telling a story for a reason. This was Wanda's and Vision's story. So listen to that story and stop trying to put your own interjections of fandom into it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last bit of spoiler territory. I don't know if it's spoiler territory, but there's one thing that did irk me the wrong way. And the one thing, I'm not sure if you're going to agree with me on this, though. The one thing that did irk me was that they included the Salem witch trials into <laughs> the MCU. <laughs> yes. From what I understand, that's context for the characters that is important for character reason. But, yeah, it is kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, how many, not witches, but women were burned during the Salem witch trials because there were zero witches yeah. burned. I know that much. <laughs> it is a big can of worms that they're opening. Yes, I agree. If that is where you're going with this. That is exactly where I'm going with this. <laughs> and for them to include it, yes, I get it for its character reasons, but as can of worms go, you get <laughs> all the baggage that comes with it. Like, yes. oh, hey, you know, they were right in Salem, a 1600s. <laughs> and, oh, maybe there were witches among them. Well, right. Really? Yeah, there weren't. Zero you get, witches. You get into that, though, with any modern witch um, stories, though, because as soon as you open, yeah, as soon as you connect it to anything, any of the actual real life events, and you also have real witches, that, yeah, you're kind of opening that. Um, so it's not the first time that something like this has done it. Maybe on a biggest, like as big of a scale as this, maybe it's worrisome potentially. Um, but yeah, I didn't even. I mean, it goes to show you that I didn't, it didn't even occur to me that that was a, pot, a potential complication. But you're right. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they actually continue going down that road. Somebody I saw was commenting that this could be something that they tie into the Doctor Strange film. Um, Wanda. Maxwell will show up in mm. Doctor Strange. That has been confirmed. Yeah. Which is why a lot of people were speculating that Doctor Strange would show up in this. Could but happen. Nope, that didn't happen. I mean, yeah, that's that ship has sailed. But like, yeah, it could have some sort of con connection to the next Doctor Strange film. Yep. We'll see. Yep. Well, geez, anything else you want to talk about with WandaVision or did we kind of hit it? Kind of hit everything. I yeah. give it a watch. I'm trying to go through it now in like a binge series. It's good. See how it goes if... from front to back instead of waiting. Yeah. Week. I think where I'm at with it right now is that I think it's good. It does really interesting things and it's interesting throughout, but I'm not quite ready to be like, 
oh, this thing is amazing, I'm like hesitant because I don't think it quite nailed the landing for me, but it is a fascinating piece of television and it is Marvel taking risks with their property, which is only good and I only want them to do more. Oh, so. uh, yes, that is one thing I would like to bring up. I liked that they didn't do um, Man Saves Woman in this. Uh, yeah. WandaVision is the problem to all this. She's also the solution to all this. And Well, solution, sure. Yeah. Solution. <laughs> of sorts. But she doesn't uh, depend on anyone to save her from this. She does it herself. Right. It's interesting. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess so. Also, do you think this is a one-off? I mean, it seems like it is. Do you think that they will... This the, format is a one-off. Yeah, that this Can't is Can't do it. the same format again. And it seems like that's probably going to be the case for all these series. Um, maybe. Potentially see how they go. Yeah, just kind of tell your mini series story. So that all, that makes that actually will be important come any time. This is a mini a limited series. series. Yeah, this becomes a limited series then, as opposed to a a series series. So. Right. We'll see. We'll see what happens with it. All right. I think. It is time to move on. Please, we need to. <laughs> I agree. Let's talk about some cancellations and renewals. Right, First, what am I no longer watching? Well, on FX, you are going to soon no longer be watching Pose, as the third season of Pose will be its last. This upcoming third season. Apple TV Plus has decided to renew Dear Dot Dot Dot. That's For a not second Dear season. White Person. That's an Netflix yes. show. This is something else. Dear... Dear Dot, dot, dot. dot, dot, dot. So they've already two seasons of that. USA is bringing end to Queen of the South after five seasons. This upcoming fifth season will be its finale. CBS was re is renewing The Equalizer for a second season. You called that. Netflix is done with special after two seasons. Its second will be its last. Yep, the upcoming second will be its last. Then we have a couple of deaths. No major ones, thankfully, this week, uh, but just a couple to talk about here. Trevor Peacock, age 89, an actor. Well, I don't know what that is. The Vicar of Dibley? Yes, the Vicar of Dibley. Okay. Hamlet and was in Fred Claus, apparently. And Roger Mudd, age 80, 93. His name was Mudd. Broadcast journalist on Meet the Press and the NBC Nightly News. Uh, one of the big broadcasters from the 70s and 60s. Yeah. And that's it. With this half of the show, let's flip it over to you and we'll talk about some music. All right, let's get into music. And while we start music with the Billboard, and we start the Billboard with the Hot 100. First up, Still, your number yeah. one song, Driver's License by Olivia Rodrigo. It will not drive away. <laughs> it's staying in our neighborhood. It's just it's hanging around. Go somewhere, <laughs> will you? <laughs> <laughs> you have a driver's license. Just go already. <laughs> you can go anywhere you want. You don't have to keep coming back to this neighborhood. Uh, uh, number two, Up by Cardi B. Three, Blinding Whites by The Weeknd at four. 34 plus 35 by Ariana Grande. And at number five, Go Crazy by Chris Brown featuring Young Thug. If yeah. all of that sounds familiar. Because it only one it, swap happened. Blinding Light switched places with Go Crazy this week. That's it. <laughs> As for your Billboard 200, your albums chart, still your number one album, Dangerous, the double album by Morgan Wallen. Still there. At two, The Highlights by The Weeknd. At three, Shoot for the Stars, <laughs> Aim for the Moon by Pop Smoke. At number four, Shiesty Season by Pooh Shiesty. And rounding out your top five, The Voice by <laughs> Lil Durk. Yep. Same old, same old. It also same top five. If you didn't like any of those albums, or if you would like to see a new album in the top five, we God, have I new would. releases. <laughs> None of these, though. Well, maybe one. Maybe one, because we have Dream Logic by A.G. Cook. 
A History of Nomadic Behavior by I Hate God, <laughs> which is I E Y E. Yeah, like, like an eyeball. Mm-hmm. We also have The Lunar Injection Kool Aid Eclipse Conspiracy <laughs> by Rob Zombie. <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay, sure. Yeah. Let's just throw some Mad Libs, uh, see what sticks. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, a s- album that will probably hit the top five. Probably. Spaceman by Nick Jonas. Yep. Spaceman. Spaceman's never gonna bring me down. <laughs> not that Spaceman. No, 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 not that Spaceman. <laughs> It's all in your mind. It's not Spachemin either. <laughs> Mr. Spachemin. <laughs> Dr. Spachemin. Dr. Spachemin. No, Dr. Spachemin is his father. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's get into some music news, shall we? Let's. And first up, ooh, <laughs> someone's in some hot water. Bubble, bubble. As Winston Marshall, you know, everyone knows Winston Marshall. Do I? Yeah. He's the banjo player for Mumford and Sons. Ah. One of the Mumford and Sons who is not a Mumford. So or does that son. make him a son? He's part of the son. <laughs> well, the son is taking some time away from the group following social media backlash regarding a tweet in which he praised right-wing writer Andy No. In the since-deleted tweet posted over the weekend, <laughs> Marshall who is British. That's important. Congratulated Andy No on publishing his most recent book, Unmasked. Which <laughs> looks at... <laughs> he did the same hand movement. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> which looks at Antifa's radical plan to destroy democracy. The damn Antifa. Right. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> Anti-fascist's radical plan to destroy <laughs> democracy. <laughs> I know, so radical. Finally, the time has the finally had <laughs> finally the time has come. This is the Sorry. tweet. This is the tweet. The tweet read: "Finally had the time to read your important book. <laughs> You're a brave man." <laughs> In a statement posted to his Twitter account on Tuesday night, Marshall apologized for the tweet <laughs> and announced that he'll be taking a leave of absence from the band to quote. Examine my blind spots. So even if you are a British person, I still feel like you should at least have a general idea what your fans might think of making a political statement like this. Just a general idea. So I don't think him being British here is an excuse, like a lot of people are pointing out, because you should know, right, to like a certain extent, especially if you do... I don't know, most of your business in the United States, which I'm sure Mumford and Sons do, don't tweet that shit. Like, you should just know. You should just know. Like, maybe don't support this dude who has, like, an obviously awful agenda where he's making up of stuff that doesn't exist. I don't know. It just seems a little completely tone deaf. And I'm glad that he's maybe taking some time out to think about it. Also, whenever you're going against Antifa, you're basically anti anti fascism. <laughs> which is pro fascism. I know. A lot of people don't think of it that way though. There's this like vast conspiracy that there's people out there that have ill begotten, you know, like that are trying to use that term in ways that are, you know, sneaky and like no. The truth is is that there's been no evidence of of anyone under that banner doing anything nefarious um time after time and so it just it seems silly to still be here in 2021 especially as a british person and being like oh yeah no you're brave for having written this book it's like come on come on he's not brave and you're not brave for tweeting about it either mr marshall um one of the things that kind of happened as a side effect of this though is that a lot of people are just ragging on Mumford and Sons this week on the internet, which, you know, I'll take it. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) Yes. Um, Also, real briefly, um, speaking of British and monarchies, (laughs) uh, the Meghan Markle, Harry, (laughs) Styles, not Styles, the Harry, not (laughs) Styles. (laughs) Thankfully, 
interview. We don't have to cover any of that on this podcast because it is outside of the purvey of our subjects. I mean, thankfully. technically, it's uh, would fall under thoughts. It, if we watched yeah, it if we watched it but you know we didn't <laughs> you know yeah we that's didn't. a television story i guess it is but yeah it's okay we had bigger things to talk about this week yeah like hockey <laughs> like hockey <laughs> all right so yeah that's all we need to talk about with the mumford and the sun right um, and speaking of bigger things to talk about yes you would think florida congressman matt gates would have bigger things to talk about <laughs> as a congressman than britney this, spears here we are and yet here we are. You never have one of those moments where you're like, yeah, I guess I agree with this person on this specific subject, but literally nothing else will have one of those moments with the story. And it's just a, it's a weird crossover. Yeah. And like you said, yes, you agree with them, but also... <laughs> Only on this specific You thing. shouldn't be bringing this up as a congressman. Right. But okay, so what, what's the story here? So... Um, Matt Gates is requesting the House Judiciary Committee to halt what it's doing and hold <laughs> a hearing on court-ordered conservatorship, specifically referencing the Free Britney movement. Because Matt Gates, who, in addition to being a staunch fan of <laughs> Donald Trump, yeah. is also apparently a lifelong <laughs> fan of Britney Spears. There is some crossover <laughs> in that circle. Yeah, that Venn diagram is two separate circles, and yet somehow he's like at the very like fringe of that. <laughs> uh, so Matt Gates is fighting for the pop star to be freed from her court-ordered conservatorship as part of his request for Congress to hold a hearing on conservatorship due process. In a letter to Representative Jerry Nadler, who is chair of the House Judiciary Committee, Gates and Congressman Jim Jordan... Yes, that Jim Jordan of <laughs> Ohio State who oversaw a lot of the um, gymnastic scandals while he was tenured at the Ohio State. Yep. That Jim Jordan <laughs> uh, named the recent documentary produced by the New York Times framing Britney Spears, which has brought the Princess of Pops conservatorship directly into the spotlight. Quote, the House Committee on the Judiciary is charged with safeguarding the rights affording to Americans by the U.S. Constitution. These rights include having the free will to guide one's own affairs and the legal autonomy over one's own finances. When situations suggest the unjust deprivation of those rights by the government, we have an obligation to conduct oversight and explore potential remedies, the letter states. So, and yeah. yes, that sounds yeah. right. Up to a point, though. I think you're right that, yeah, it's maybe not a great time to do this. Um, but this is the ball, this, this taking the ball that was that where it from was left over after that documentary, right? The documentary leaves it kind of open about like, hey, litigation could change this. Like, this is an opportunity now to put in the court's hands and be like, hey, there are ways where we could reconsider what a conservatorship, conservatorship looks like. This is that. But you're right. Is this the time to do it? Are these the people we want doing it? Is this a best use of resources? Yeah, there's a lot of questions to ask. I'm no politician. Yeah. But <laughs> don't you start too. I already have somebody in my life telling me that that's a thing I should pursue. Um, <laughs> um, and I have no plans on doing that. Um, yeah. But... So I can't really speak to I'm just to leaving it. the door open for you. Yeah, I can't speak anything to anything about it. What I can say is it's very rare that I agree with a Republican, but here he's he's got a point. Yes, and this conservatorship for Britney Spears has been going on for literal years. Yeah. De decade? Decades. Plus? A decade plus? Yeah, a decade plus. Yeah. So it's 20, 2007, 2008. Yeah. Almost a decade and a half at this point. Uh, yep. So yeah, it's 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 about time something to get done with it. I think the documentary makes a good uh, claim of that this is not just a Britney Spears problem. This is a conservatorship problem. And that we need to look at that from a legal standpoint. So yes, yes. this needs to happen. But I don't know if this is the way. But we'll have to wait for the Netflix documentary to come out. To <laughs> yes. get a full view of look at the real story then. All right, let's get into some thoughts here, shall we? Let's get into a thought. You listened to something. I listened to something. 
Um, so I did not invest in cryptocurrency. <laughs> oh, you didn't get the non-fungible token version of this? No, but I did listen to the new Kings of Leon album. <laughs> How fungible was it? Did you funge all over it? Did you get your mitts on it? Uh, kind of. <laughs> A lot of bass in this. Yeah, bass. Yeah. So, uh, so the new Kings of Leon album, <laughs> When You See Yourself. Okay. Uh, whenever I look in a mirror. Uh, um, whenever yes. I do a Zoom call. <laughs> Once a week. Yeah, once a week. I only see myself once a week. No other times. That's why I look so much like this. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> a lot of heavy in the bass, first okay. off. You a Kings of Leon lines. fan, generally speaking? Or are you just kind of casual? Um, like, you know, back in high school. Around the... College. Like that one record that had the hits? Yeah. Uh, circa 20... 2009? Sex on Fire or whatever yeah, that album was 2010? Called. That was 2010, right? Yeah. So yeah, um, they are a part of my past, and I like them. Um, and if I was younger and this album came out back then, yeah, I would probably like this album. Yeah, this had a lot of fond memories on this. Listening to this thing is like, oh yeah, I liked Kings of Leon back then. Kind of don't like them now, <laughs> but I did at one point, and this kind of reminded me of that. It was like a good nostalgia walk. So yeah, I kind of like the you know, the album of When You See Yourself. It's like, yeah, you see myself listening to this back then. <laughs> so why do you think that you don't like it anymore? What are they doing now that doesn't really float your boat? Um, so if you liked the record You Somebody, one of their big hits, mm -hmm. kind of like this. Yeah. Pretty much all over every single track. Okay. That may be one thing, might just be my ears, might just be me getting old, might be it's just a sign of the times, but it's felt like every song on this album kind of ran together. Got and it. I listened to this thing front to back, and it's like, oh, did we start a new song already? <laughs> they all kind of sounded started sounding the same. So they took the formula that people liked in their biggest hits, and they've just kind of been riffing on it? Yeah, but that's not a bad thing, because you'll want people to play the hits. Sure, but it is a bad thing, potentially, if they do it too many times. And it's not enough variety to be like, oh, they try some different things here. No, it's just they do the same thing. Right, and this isn't quite a whole lot of variety for an album. Yeah. So it's an okay, okay album. Like I said, yeah. it's, it's a good listen to for like a nostalgia walk. Sure. But overall, it's an, just an okay album. Don't invest in it as a non-fungible token, is I think what we're telling people. Yes. <laughs> not, not, I'm not funging on this. Yeah, thing. you should fun, funge it. You should not non-funge it. You should definitely funge all over. All right. <laughs> you just listen to anything? Not really. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing of note, I don't think. All right, then let's round the corner and let's get to the end here, shall yeah, we? Yeah, let's talk about video games. We always leave them for last. Yeah. Because it's the big story happened in video games. A, a big report, yes. Yeah, but first we have new releases, including uh, Monster Energy <laughs> Super Cross Four okay. for the PS4. Yeah, I was gonna say take a PS5, deep breath. Five got a lot of consoles. Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and the PC. Yeah. Crash Bandicoot Four: Colon It's About Time. For the PS5, Xbox Series X, and the Switch. Yep, next gen and Switch releases for that one. We also have Kingdom of Amalur, colon, re-reckoning for the PC. Yep, that's the PC version. The console versions came out last year. And lastly, RBI Baseball 21 for PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. So if you don't want to buy the show, that's the other baseball game you can buy. I'll talk about the show later. We'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, but... Are you tired of your Nintendo Switch? No. Wish you had a new Nintendo Switch? No. <laughs> well, if you answered yes to either of these questions... <laughs> I did. Consult your doctor, because your waiting may last longer than four hours. <laughs> okay, important disclaimer here. Here at the Media Boat Podcast, we try not to talk about rumors, but if something is a report, that means that there is enough evidence for us to be comfortable reporting it. So... Voila, this story. Right. We do try not to deal in rumors. There are times, like the uh, ESPN NHL story, yeah. was going to be a rumor, but that story hit literally two hours before we started. 
So I had to change that story to say it's <laughs> yes, official. It happened. It happened. Yeah. So this is not official yet, but it looks like all signs are pointing to yes. Which, yes, this kind of has been the kind of scuttlebutt around the internet for at least the past year of, hey, when are we getting a new Switch? Is there a yeah. Switch Pro coming around? It's been a couple of years. You should update the Switch. <laughs> switch up the Switch, please. Switch it, switch it up. So after reports surfaced last year that Nintendo would be producing a new Switch model capable of 4K output, this year, a new story from Bloomberg has some more specifics about the long-rumored new version of the handheld console hybrid. According to the report, the new model will launch this year, 2021, and include a 7-inch OLED screen that runs at 720 resolution, courtesy of Samsung. This is a little bit bigger than either of the Switch models currently on the market, as the original device had a 6.2-inch 720 screen, and the Switch Lite has a slightly smaller 5.5-inch at 720 LCD screen. So if you're playing in handheld mode, there's not going to be a resolution update. However, Bloomberg's report does say the new device will apparently be able to output to 4K if docked and connected to a 4K compatible TV. Sources say the new Switch model will begin production sometime in June and will go on sale this holiday season. Fingers are crossed, though, because after that fiasco with the Xbox Series X, S, and PlayStation 5 launches, Nintendo may have something in place to avoid shortages. Yeah, I mean, it's weird to have a story about a console launch this year, seeing how the other consoles have barely still even launched. Nobody can get them. And so it's wild for Nintendo, when they do eventually have to announce this, it'll be wild for them to be like, hey, we got one too. Good luck in this. It's like, hey, you got that 4K? <laughs> Check out this. You play Mario on 4K now. So, yeah. But the other side of this is that there is an argument for a new Switch. Uh, I was being a little silly. Yes, I'm not personally the mar in market for a new Switch. I barely touch my Switch at all. It's kind of sad, but, like, I play it every once in a while. I have a good time with it, but it's not something I constantly am playing. Uh, but... Recent games and recent footage of unreleased games have suggested that the innards of the current Switch are not where they need to be for modern games. Um, a lot of people's reaction to that Pokemon uh, Legends Ar Arceus game was that it had a terrible looking frame rate. Sure, that game is in development. We don't know if that's how it's going to look like when it comes out. But considering that Sword and Shield also had frame rate issues on the Switch, it's not a good sign. Now, you got your Switch early on. Fairly early on. A year I got in. mine as the new Nintendo Switch. The, the light. Updated battery. Right. Around the time that they launched the light, yeah. Right. So, I don't think we're in the market for 4K upgrade. Yeah. But if you've been holding out for a specific 4K upgrade for the Switch, you may be in luck this holiday season. Assuming mm -hmm. you're not using your 4K TV for the Xbox Series X or... Yeah. The PS5. Of course. Of course. Im that's assuming you could get your hands on those. <laughs> right. Consoles. Important important note though is if you're thinking that this is going to be this magical like leap in, in technology to get to parity with the other two consoles, think again. This is Nintendo. This is a half step. This is going to be somewhere. I think people are saying this think more along the lines of PS4 Pro. This is also a half step because it's only outputting while docked. Yes. It's output in a handheld mode. So that's an interesting And every point. game that comes out for the Switch has to run mm -hmm. from the uh, light. Yeah. From the Switch light. So that's your base that every game has to run on. And it only goes up from there. So that's an interesting point, too, because I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a um, similar situation to um, when they launched the new Nintendo 3DS, which was also a beefier set of chips inside the same thing all the games also well most of the games had to also run on a base 3ds and so what you saw is games running really badly on original 3ds models but running decently on the newer one i think that's what you're going to see here i think that if they do launch this thing your pokemon legends and games like that are gonna run like run wonderfully on the new system and maybe be really really hard 
cells on the older systems. I think it's going to maybe divide your player base. Womp womp. Yeah, but that's Nintendo for you. This, they've done it before. They're going to do it again. All right. Well, if you're going to want a new console, you're going to want some money to buy it. <laughs> of course, you can also just buy a studio. <laughs> because it's official. Our second yes. story is Microsoft and Bethesda deal of $7.5 billion effectively closed? Yeah, it's done. Uh, they had, you know, they had all the, like, different, like, European and American, like, um, security exchange people look at it. They said it's all good to go. So this is inked. The deal is done. Yep. So, but that means that Bethesda and all of its studios are now part of the Xbox Game Studios. Which, yeah, it, I mean, we we said this thing was happening. They announced it was happening. But now that it's gone through everything, all the, the T's are dotted and the I's are crossed. Everything <laughs> is good. It's all in writing now. Uh, they've confirmed a few things about the deal, specifically regarding the exclusivity of Bethesda games moving forward. Because in a post on the Xbox Wire, head of Xbox and Media Boat sometimes favorite, Phil Spencer, <laughs> made it, makes it sound like the deal won't make every game coming out of Bethesda Studios exclusive to Xbox or Windows, but at least some percentage of them will be. Quote, this is the next step in building an industry-leading first-party studios team, a commitment we have to our Xbox community with the addition of the Bethesda creative team's Gamers, you should know that Xbox consoles, PC, and Game Pass will be the best place to experience new Bethesda games, including some new titles in the future that we will be exclusive to Xbox and PC players. So yeah, more or less what this confirms is that some Bethesda games moving forward will be Xbox exclusive, not all. So that means if Bethesda decides that the next Elder Scrolls, they want to sell a billion copies again, just like Skyrim, they'll put that shit on everything. They'll do it. I don't. So at least we know at that at this point that it's not just everything going to be Microsoft Game Studios branded. It'll be wider than that. Basically, if it's a big enough franchise game that they want to make a lot of money on, mm -hmm. expect it to be everywhere. The They're other thing that pigeonhole it. Yeah. The other thing that got confirmed in this uh, that's not in this news story is that. Game Pass, there will be in the coming weeks Bethesda games coming to Game Pass more than the ones that are already there. So look forward to more Game Pass uh, games in the Bethesda universe of titles. So that's exciting. All right. And that's it. Uh, oh, also, because they're, getting, they're being sold to a bigger company, um, this does mean that employees should get some type of bonus out of it because employees are part of that... Um, IPO and sales, so they should be getting some type of like SARS bonus from this. So, congratulations! Congratulations! All right, invest in GameStop. GameStop. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do no. that anymore. It's a bad idea. Anyway, <laughs> anyways, uh, so that's it for video games. Um, two things. I have two thoughts, real okay. quick. One, I'm playing Control. Haven't yep. beaten it yet, but I can see why people like that game. Yeah, so I've good. Pretty much unlocked everything. I'm kind of heading towards the end of it, but it's a real good game. Kind of cool. like it. Great. Uh, but the game I really want to talk about is okay. a game that's not out yet. <laughs> MLB The Show 21. All right. Wants you. Me? Well, maybe you, but <laughs> most likely me. Uh -huh. Probably you, but me. <laughs> to be a part of the tech demo for it. Ooh, tech demo. Oh, well, yeah, I got an exclusive download code for it. I downloaded it. Nice. And all across it is saying, hey, don't copyright this because I know it's you. Because it's got my gamer tag everywhere. Uh -huh. <laughs> so aside from that being screened everywhere, uh, this looks like a really good game. Yeah. Aside it's from being a tech demo. We've liked the um, show in the past, uh, past years. Like the show from the past. Um, every team is technically in a part of this tech demo. Okay. But you would have to play them specifically. Um, it's not, and there's only three, four stadiums, I think, that are given. But for it being a demo, it's a pretty good demo. Um, cool. there's a mode called practice mode where you can play like a 2020 game with no fans. <laughs> fans, nice. 
Uh, but other than that, it plays like an MLB the show. It looks like the show looks really good. Kind of excited to see how this is going to do on the Xbox. I'm probably playing yeah. on PlayStation, but hey, the show is back. I think they kind of gave it to me because I own every all the shows from 2018 on. That certainly might be part of it. <laughs> I mean, it's not my fault that PlayStation just gives it to me for free every year. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to trying it out. I'm not sure on what platform yet. If they still think crossing my fingers over here for a PC version. <laughs> Right. But I don't know if we'll get it. But yeah, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you been playing anything or is that it? That I think will do it. I have not jumped back into video games. I have some birthday money that I may spend on some video games, but uh, we'll see. All right. Uh, plug away then. All right. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Media Boat Podcast. We will be back next week for another episode. If you want to see us in video form, you can go to YouTube, search Media Boat Podcast to find our channel, like, subscribe, everything you do on YouTube, the usual. If you want to hear audio versions of our podcast, those are on podcast services such as Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify even. So check us out by searching Media Boat Podcast on any of those platforms and download our episodes. You can find us on social media at Media Boat Cast is our Twitter handle. See us update when there's new episodes for you to listen to. There's also a Facebook page. If you search Media Boat Podcast on Facebook, you might find it. And if you want to give us feedback about the show, ask us questions, anything that you want to say to us, please email us at mediaboatpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week. I'm going to peace out and have a good birthday tomorrow. And see you guys next time. Yes. Do we sing to you happy birthday now or never? No, no, no singing. We did that last time. No that singing. was last year's episode. Oh, yeah. No that, by the way, this does officially um, yes. reach the one year mark of doing these from home. Doing these from home. So, I mean, we always did them from home, but remote, I guess. <laughs> yes. Not, not together. I can't yes. reach out and slap your knee or anything. Good. I'm glad. All right. That was really. You also can't buy me sandwiches, which is the downside. But that is a part of the downside. Yes, that is the downside to me. All right, thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week. I'm gonna give myself a sandwich or something. Peace out. Okay. Bye. Bye.